Johnson. Yeah, I know. This is the highlight of your day. <laughs> All right. Um, let me put this on. So, uh, uh, give me a second here. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for allowing me to come and chat with you guys just for a few minutes. Um, my name is Maureen Dolan. I am a faculty member in the Biological Sciences Department. I am also affiliated uh, and director of the biotechnology program that is also embedded. Um, for those of you who are biotech majors, you know this, but pre I'm guessing a bulk of you are pre-professional majors and um, actually the curriculum for pre-professional and biotech have a huge amount of overlap. So uh, I wanted to um, take this moment to sort of tell you about the program and potential opportunities that you might consider um, either shifting a major and or considering a double major. So um, many of you probably know the, the area of biotech, I mean, especially in the, in the current pandemic, um, the biotechnology has become absolutely paramount uh, industry as we're moving forward for solutions. And um, if you look at biotechnology, this is basically taking techniques from living systems and making products and solutions for the real world. And that's how I sort of look at that. There's four major categories of that, and you can go into agricultural biotech. Um, we're in the Delta, so this is any of our crops, uh, animals um, for animal improving animal health, making genetic, you know, using genetic uh, recombination, but also other technologies um, related to just enhanced nutrition associated with biotechnology. Uh, the other one that probably a lot of you, is there a way to forward? Is it? Oh, there we go. There we go. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, the other one that most of you are probably uh, really aware of is in medical um, technology, biotechnology. And so um, a lot, you know, the fastest growing uh, industry in pharmaceutical right now is protein-based drugs. You're seeing these all over the place, particularly monoclonal antibodies. And so that all comes out of the biotechnology industry as well as all of these testing setups. Other sort of areas are industrial. Um, we don't think about this, but um, there are enzymes for a lot of our detergents today have enzyme recombinant enzymes. And so that's an area of industrial technology, an example of industrial technology. And finally, if you really love the computer or the computational science side of the fence, um, this is a the most rapidly growing field in biotechnology is in bioinformatics, basically dealing with these huge data sets and trying to basically interpret them and computationally um, um, run those. So I, what can you do with a biotechnology BS degree? I can sit and talk, but the proof is in the pudding with our graduates. And so I wanted to, I highlighted three of them because they took three different tracks. Colton Batten is currently in DO school, second year, second, second year. And uh, at NYIT, he actually did a double major. So, I, and I'll talk about that in just a second in pre-professional and biotechnology. Um, when I chat with Colton, it may, it helped him definitely on the MCAT with the biotech because it's really putting things into practice. And he found that really helpful. Another route, another student of ours took is Tristan Wright. He is, um, I'm super, uh, very proud. He is in a doctoral program over in St. Jude's. This is a highly competitive uh, program. Um, and they, if you look at, if you go to St. Jude's and look at who the students are, they're coming from big institutions. So I'm super proud that we have representation uh, in this program, in this doctoral program. Um, but the majority of our students thus far actually have gone and decided to either do gap years, a couple of gap years, and then go before they go on to school or just um, really enter the job market. And so uh, Kira Keefe is also over in St. Jude's as a research technologist. In fact, I wanna sort of, you know, with all the pandemic going on, our graduates that graduated out of our biotech program last year, 
all landed jobs. In a couple of cases, they landed two jobs, but because of the pandemic, things got shifted. So this is a really hot market. And so um, we feel like we're giving our students the ability to um, get the tools and the experience they need in order to um, be uh, competitive, both uh, on the academic side of the fence, but also uh, uh, on the, in the job market. Um, this is, and I will leave this with, uh, you'll have this recorded so you can look at this a little closer. Uh, what I, this is the degree plan. If you look on the right of the screen, you'll see chemistry, physics, and math looking pretty similar for those of you who are in pre-professional. One exception is we also take the lab for biochem, which kind of makes sense because this is a really hands-on intensive program. The, on the left-hand side are all of the courses um, and you'll see a ton of overlap. The ones that are bolded are, are um, distinct to the biotech program. However, I was just talking to Dr. Johnson and some of your electives, for example, molecular biology is now considered an elective. So it's, you're, you're kind of hitting it. And we were just talking even bioinformatics is another one. What we are hearing from our students is the, one, the courses that are the most useful to them in terms of moving on to graduate school to the job market are bioinformatics, molecular biology, and then our hands-on problem-based labs. I know you're used to you know, more bigger labs. These are smaller labs. You actually take a project and you take it through an entire academic year from biotechniques one to two. So you're really getting um, um, experience and, and real hands-on. Also, I highlight our electives. We really encourage our students to do independent study. If you're in honors, you can do that through there or through biology or chemistry or any of the other departments. Um, also, uh, honors thesis uh, can be used as your bio electives. And we do require one business course, but honestly, there's a couple of courses I would recommend for all biology students. I think they're fabulous. And so our students have found them really useful. If you are interested in, I, I know you have really packed schedules, but if you're at all interested in sort of learning more, our introductory class is a two credit course. It's called Biotech and the Global Society. You would be above and beyond. I mean, this will be, um, you're, you're, you'll have a good, a, a really solid background, but it would allow you to sort of look to see um, if this might be something, that's one option to see if that's something you're interested in. Also, I want to make a shout out that um, both by bi the biotech and the pre-professional can use, um, I know one of the, the frustrations of science students is obviously right now, not, not a big deal, but the concept of studying abroad is challenging because you have a really tight schedule. So the Corretro campus in Mexico actually um, it, it, has both the biotech and the pre-professional major. So you, you could actually study abroad and not lose ground in terms of your uh, majors. So I'm going to uh, stop there. And um, I'll leave, again, this is information. Please feel free to contact me, um, email me if this is at all interesting to you. Also, um, if you're a pre-professional, if you're interested in some of the more hands-on courses, the prerequisites, you oftentimes have them. So come see me if, if that's of interest to you and I'll be happy to work this out. Down the road, if you're, if you're younger, we're, we're in the midst of also working on a certificate program, which could be done post-graduation if you so chose um, in biotech. And so that may be another option. You have a lot of the courses, so it would be adding on a few more in order to get that certificate. With that, I will stop. I'll take any questions. Um, if or if you want to just contact me just in the element of time. Okay. So I was just getting comfortable. <laughs> Sorry to disturb you. Okay. Can I get my no you can't. No. Anyway. Thank you all. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. One of the things I just wanted to briefly add real quick that on commercials you see a lot of the treatments for autoimmune disorders and that sort of thing. And if you look at the drugs that are listed, you'll see the suffix MAB on it, which is actually standing for a monoclonal antibody. So a lot of, 
a lot of our current treatments are antibody driven, you know, which is really cool. And the ones that are IV, a lot of them are inhibitors. And a lot that used to be just strictly chemical inhibitors, they're now protein based inhibitors. So there's, this is a huge, which then brings them into biotech. So um, su super, really interesting field. So anyway, thank you. And one of the cool things too, just to bring this up, um, uh oh, no, nope, don't want to do that. Is uh, there we go. Well, we'll just do it this way. Um, anyway, one of the cool things too is that if you're not going into the health professions or you decide not to go into the health professions, um, this is your best job potential out there. Okay, tremendous, uh, you know, because it comes down to supply and demand. And it's an area where, um, yeah, good. Uh, it's an area where um, there's just not enough people for the jobs that are needed. So it, good paying, and, and I'm not a paid spokesperson, so I'm not getting anything for this, but it's still for, if you don't decide you don't wanna do health professions, um, the big thing you need to decide is if you're good in terms of being meticulous and just kind of working with your hands and, and working in a laboratory setting, because that's obviously what it's about. Okay, so um, we were talking about uh, the Hardy-Weinberg equation. In lab, one of the things that I brought up in lab and I'll bring up again today, that this equation only works when populations are in equilibrium, okay? And so the criteria for the Hardy-Weinberg equation have to be that that population is not changing. Try that. There we go. Okay, the population is not changing. I want to just make sure it's there. Yeah, there we go. Um, and so what we're looking for to keep that in a non-changing population, typically it has to be a large population and it has to be one that's not prone to selection. So in, in lab this week, there's a lot of selection going on. But normally if you're truly using the Hardy-Weinberg equation as needed, there shouldn't be selection, okay? Uh, so one, one trait, one outcome shouldn't be favored over another one. And another one, big one too, is the idea of migration. That if individuals are coming or going from the population, then that's gonna change the dynamics of this and alter your real ability to use this in, in a predictive manner. And then the third one too, and by the way, on selection, that includes sexual selection in terms of mates mate choice in terms of looking for those. And then the third one is really not too big a deal. Uh, that really a lack of mutations. So, you know, mutations, you're looking on the order of one in 10,000, one in 100,000 types of events in terms of out there. It's really not gonna be disruptive to the dynamics of what we're dealing with, okay? So we're just going to do some more problems here just to kind of see how we do with this. So I'd like you to take sickle cell and this is the frequency of the disease and I want you to calculate the allele frequencies for sickle cell. Okay. By the way, is Taylor here? You look. Might as well. And Haley Finley. Hmm. 
Okay, so if we think about the equation in terms of what we've got, this is the whole key to being able to do this. What within the Hardy-Weinberg equation does this represent, okay? So sickle cell is a recessive disease, okay? So that number represents Q squared, okay? So you find out what you're given, and then you've got to understand what you're being asked. Because if you don't have the first, you'll never get to the second. If you don't know where you're headed, you're just driving blind down a road. Okay? So really what I was asking for, just to make sure we're there, is I was asking for P and Q. That's what I was asking for in that question, okay? So in lab, the key thing that I talked to you about is focusing on the recessive phenotype. That's crucial to working through this because your three genotypes, again, are P squared, 2PQ, And both of these together give you the dominant phenotype. And Q squared by itself gives you the recessive phenotype. Okay, you know that everybody that's got the recessive trait is homozygous for that trait. Okay, so if Q squared is one in 2,500, that means that Q and this is where your calculators come in, but the math is pretty easy on that. Q is one in 50. It's one in 50 squared is one in 2,500. And that means that P is 49 out of 50, okay? Now on the test, I don't care if you give it to me in a number like that, or you give it to me at 0.98 and 0.02, it's fine, okay? My role is to help you understand what you're doing and how to get there. And I'm not a math teacher to where I'm not gonna, I'm gonna discount you for not going to a decimal answer rather than a proportion. Okay, so either one of those are fine because they're both correct. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so that answered that. So then we go to Tay-Sachs. Tay-Sachs is again a recessive disease. So one in 6,000 then represents Q squared. Okay. So who's got an answer for that? That one I don't do as in my head quite as easy as the other one. But. By the way, typically we'll go two decimal points. Sometimes you have to go further on these um, rare scenarios, rare diseases, but normally we'll just go a couple of decimal points. So what is the square root of one over 6,000? That's what I'm asking. 0.01. Okay. So 0 0.01, is that what you got? And P then is the rest of one, which is 0 0.99. Okay. So the math is easy. The alphabet is what you have to understand. Okay. That's the whole key to population genetics is keeping in track. Do I have P? Do I have Q? Do I have P squared, 2PQ, Q squared? What in those five possibilities do I have? So once you know which of those you have, the next question is, what am I looking for? Which of those five am I looking for? Okay. So then we go to neurofibromatosis. And I'd like you to do that one.
Okay, so you've all filled out those forms where the question at the end, always you always have to check off that box and say, I'm not a robot, right? Okay, so if you're taking one in 5,000 as Q squared and square rooting it, you're acting like a robot. Okay, why did I say that? Because neurofibromatosis is dominant. Okay, so what you need to understand with that then is that Q squared equals 4,999 out of 5,000. That changes your math tremendously, doesn't it? Okay, and I don't need to ask you who did that because I don't really care at this point but most of you started cranking along with your Q squared of one in 5,000 just because we did a couple of problems. So you need to back off a little bit as you're doing these things and don't turn into that robot that they keep asking you not to be on forms and think through, am I dealing with a dominant condition or recessive? And then you know how to attack it, okay? So just think these things through before you just kind of get started and auto automatically start doing this on your calculator because that's when you get yourself in trouble. Okay, so yes. Could you find two and then like could you do that of one divided by two thousand? Could it with two and then find No, really you need to go with Q squared and do it that way. Okay, so draw your line. This is the end of exam four. And I'll just go ahead and reiterate this, that this whole PowerPoint, even the slides that we covered already. So we're on uh, slide seven. The first six slides will also be on exam five, okay? So because of the way this will all overlap out, those first six slides will be on exam four and exam five because the concepts we're expanding beyond at this point. Okay, anybody have a question on that? So this is your stopping point for exam four, but exam five will also include that other stuff. Okay, so now we're dealing with a codominant scenario. The first six slides, we're dealing with simple dominant recessive. Now we're looking at codominant. So a third blood group that is out there is called the MN group. And the M and the N allele are both expressed. Anytime you have surface antigens, you're talking about a uh, possible expression on that um, red blood cell. And so you can have then that codominance that we're dealing with. So go ahead and read this. Go ahead and write down some of the key numbers in terms of what we've got. And so my question for you is, what's the frequency of the M allele? What's the frequency of the N allele? Okay. And so one question is, in fact, ignore that one because that'll just throw you off for a little bit. But it's superficially, if you look at this, it superficially looks like a one to two to one ratio. Okay. You see that the one in the middle is twice that of the other two. Okay. So again, the questions are, what's the frequency of the N allele? What's the frequency? Uh, the M, because that's the other half of two, and then the frequency of heterozygotes is the last question. So go ahead and solve for that.
at least the ten lights were right in the bottom of the raft. Here's what the difference about co-dominant alleles. You see all the alleles. Normally, when you're talking about dominant recessive, you cannot see the outcomes of the alleles. When you're dealing with antigens like this, you're actually seeing the product. Okay? That may or may not have helped you. It is Friday, I understand. It is the semester. Something out, right? Okay. You got a few more weeks left. You've got one more week, and then you've got uh, Thanksgiving break. And just don't don't totally lose all your concentration that last week. So let's see how to do this thing. Look at that equation. Think about what it's telling you. And then the answer is easy once you understand the why. Okay. So go ahead and write this down. And here's the numbers. So let's deal with the process here. Calculators are easy. It's the process that's tough, right? Okay, look at the top row. Individuals that are MM are contributing two Ms to that population, okay? That being the case, you've got 1,787 individuals that are MM times two. So it's about 35 something allele, 3,500 alleles from the MM group. Does that make sense? If you're homozygous, you've got two, two alleles of that to contribute to the population. Then you look at the middle line, the second line, and your MN, you've got one allele to contribute to the population. So those 3,000 individuals are contributing one allele. So if we go back to this equation here, you see two times mm, in other words, that's 1700 plus individuals times two because they're homozygous. And you've got plus the mn individuals, that's a 3000 number there, and they're contributing one. Okay. So you have a numerator from those two values and your denominator is basically what we call your gene pool. Remember in lab, we've talked about the word gene pool. The gene pool is how big the population is times two. You're dealing with diploids. So it's two times your number of individuals. So if we go back to here, you're looking at 6,100 plus individuals and you've got 12,200 plus 258 alleles, okay? When you deal with codominance, it's what we call a direct count analysis. You're not using the Hardy-Weinberg equation. This is why this is on exam five instead of four, because if I spring this on you today and boom, hit you with it Monday, it may not get there, okay? I'm giving you a little more time to procrastinate before you have to learn this stuff. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So you see all the alleles. You see when an individual is homozygous for M. You see when an individual is homozygous for N. And you see when they're heterozygous. So if we look at the second question, it says, what's the frequency of heterozygotes? And the answer is right there. You've got 3,000 individuals that are heterozygotes out of your total population of over 6,000, okay? So the number's there for you. It's screaming at you if you just hear it. That's the key, okay? The answers are there. So you don't have to run the equation to get to this answer. 
So another application of this codominance is when you're dealing with enzyme alleles and microsatellites. When you're looking on a gel, everything's there for you. Every allele is showing up and you can see it. And several times this semester, I've talked about the codominance of these alleles. And now you can kind of do a direct count. So your job then is to calculate the allele frequency for the uh, picture on the left. How many different alleles do you see there? Four, okay. There's four different electrophoretic mobilities. I used that term earlier. Remember that when you electrophoresis proteins, you're moving them according to their charge and their amino acid sequence, okay? So you've got four different alleles that are showing up here, okay? You've got this one at the bottom right there. And you see that that individual is heterozygous, okay? So you've got one allele that fits in what we would call the fastest allele. Okay, a lot of times we give a number to it, but we'll just call it the fastest. Okay, how many total alleles do we have showing here? How many individuals across the slide? There you go. Oops, get that out of the way. How many individuals? It's 10 individuals, 20 alleles. So the frequency for that fastest allele is one over the 20. Okay. So here's the second fastest allele right here. And we've got two individuals that are homozygous. So how many alleles are showing up? Four. Okay, this one's providing two, this one's providing two, that's four out of the 20. Then we drop over here, here's a couple of individuals there that are heterozygous. So they're each contributing one allele. So that's two over the 20. And then you see the rest of these are the slow allele. And the question is, are they homozygous? Or are they heterozygous? So if we follow this across, we've got two, four, six, eight, nine, because it's heterozygous, 10, 11, and 13. So 13 out of 20 is the allele frequency for that. Again, we call that direct count. It's easy to see just by going across and following it through. And you can do the same thing for microsatellite alleles like that, okay? So you can just follow them through and count how many alleles are of each size. Remember that microsatellites, DNAs, you're sorting based on the number of base pairs. So how many base pairs fit into each allele? With proteins, it's all about how fast or slow it's moving in the gel. And again, we call that mobility, okay? There's amino acid differences between these same enzyme, just amino acid differences that cause them to move at different speeds. That makes sense. Okay. So here we have another scenario here. So let's take this one and calculate that one.
Just curiously, how did that get there? Great shot at it. Wrong answer. But good shot at it. Anybody else? Bad chemistry. Huh? Bad chemistry. Bad chemistry. Well, we had some of that this semester. Um, not the right answer this time. So this enzyme's a dimer. That leads to another question then. Is there anyone that I'm supposed to do what with that, right? Anybody want to take a shot on how it being a diamond means anything? It has two polypeptides. Hmm? It has two polypeptides in it. Go ahead. It has two polypeptides in it. We have two polypeptides. Okay. So let's just kind of play with this for a second. So you've got a chromosome here, like so, and you've got its homolog here, like so. And let's say this is your gene right here. Okay. And so this is expressed, let's say, as an A. And we'll make this a B just so I don't make it a little little A because it's codominant. Okay. So we'll just call it a B just because it is codominant. Okay. So this is transcribing A's, which are translating to A proteins. This is transcribing B, which is translating to, excuse me, polypeptides. This is transcribing to B RNAs that is being translated to B polypeptides. As a dimer, you have an A out there that can link to another A. So it's floating around. You have B polypeptides out there that can link to other Bs. And then that intermediate one right there is that you've got A polypeptides out there that can couple up with a B. So when you've got a dimer enzyme, meaning two polypeptides coming together to give a functional enzyme, You've got these A products out there, these B products out there. The A's come together, the B's come together, but the A's and the B's come together to get a functional outcome. So you got three bands, not because we're triploids, trisomies, not because of chemistry, but because these polypeptides are out there and they couple up. And it gets messier when you look at trimers and tetramers terms of opportunities, in terms of banding patterns. Um, and with monomers, if we go back to that other slide, there, with monomers, you've just got that one polypeptide out there that is a functional enzyme. And if you see two bands, it's because you're heterozygous. Okay, so there's no third band there because with a monomer, there's only a single one. Okay. So, oops, sorry. So if we go back to this example here, let me kind of clean this up. How many different alleles do we see? There's one. There's one. And there's one. 
okay? Because this is a heterozygote and there's one of the alleles and that's the other. Same with that. So we've got three alleles. We've got those showing here. This one. And those. There. Okay. So with dimers, it's a little trickier. I'll go ahead and tell you this on the exam. I'll give you monomers. I won't give you dimers and have you have to worry about this. So for intents and purposes, that really doesn't exist. And on the test, I won't have that. Okay? Because we're trying to understand the concepts of genetics, not to be ready to go blow it out in terms of working on it. Okay, so we're looking at this fast allele, and that's a homozygote, so there's two. That's a heterozygote, that's three. Homozygote is five. Heterozygote is six. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, eight individuals. So six out of 16 alleles are that fast allele, three eighths, okay? And we go to this allele, there's two, and there's four out of 16, one fourth. And then we go up here, and we've got one, three, four, six, six out of 16. Hopefully that added up to 16 out of 16. Yes, sir. These right here, this one and that one don't count. Yeah. Because the polypeptides are the alleles, really. Anybody else? Okay. So life isn't always binary. Most of the time it's not. In other words, it's not always P and Q. Sometimes you have a third allele, fourth allele, fifth allele, et cetera. We're not going to get any more complicated than a third, third allele, just to let you know. Okay? But in this Hardy-Weinberg equation, if we go to a third allele, which is what we have in the ABO system, I've been kind of setting you up this way in terms of kind of the understanding of this. And what you do is you've got P plus Q plus R equals one, okay? And P and Q in this scenario are your codominants A and B, okay? So P is A, Q is B, and O is R. And so if we were to kind of write this out, then we've got there's your A, which is P. There's your B, which is Q. And let me say this, that you can make your B, P, and your A, Q, because they're codominant. That really doesn't matter. But your R is critical. That's like that. Okay? So if we kind of break this down, and I'm just going to show you this a little bit here. If we think of our population as 100%, and we see type A individuals are 41.8% of the population. You see this kind of burnt orange color right here? The pie is your whole population. So anybody that fits within this kind of burnt orange color 
is either homozygous for A or their AO. Okay? That's what represents that part of the equation. Then we go to B, that's 10% of the population. You see this yellow wedge here. All the individuals that fit there are either homozygous B or they're heterozygous with an O allele. Okay. So that's possible contribution to that. You see this dark blue wedge right here. Those are AB. They're absolutely heterozygous. Okay. And then you've got your O allele that is homozygous recessive. So what do you know about that O population? They make up what part of the binomial expansion? They make up R squared. So immediately you can figure out the frequency of the R, which represents the O allele. Okay? So we can take this number here, and that equals R squared. Okay? And then R is the square root of that, somewhere around 60, probably 66%, somewhere in there. Anybody have a calculator? You got a number? Don't just stare at me then. Give me a number. Okay, how about that? So, in other words, in that population, this is U.S. population, two-thirds of all the alleles are the O allele. That means the other 34% are split between the A's and the B's. And rather than just kind of work you to that point now and kind of blow into this, we're not going to come back to this till Wednesday. I'm just going to leave it at that. So somehow we have to calculate that 34% that fits into the other two alleles. Okay. But the O's easy. And the O's no different than what you did when you dealt with sickle cell or cystic fibrosis and those sorts of things. Okay, it's no different at all. The trick though is those other two alleles and how to get there. Okay, any questions about the exam? It's in house, it's here. If you, I guess I need to talk over here just to make sure we're there. So if you have to be home because of COVID, um, then I'll have an online version for you, but I need to know. That it's on. I'll give you two hours again to do it. I don't care. I can sit here for two hours as long, well as I can sit for one hour. So time's not going to be an issue for you in terms of this. Okay. See you guys Monday.